In this episode, we'll be talking about the current state of service design in Latin America. We'll talk about how do you accurately measure the effect of service design, big topic. And we'll talk about what it takes to build, lead and scale successful service design teams. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, my name is Elena Castilla and this is the Service Design Show. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you to do the work that makes you proud by designing and delivering services that have a positive impact on people and are good for business. My guest in this episode is Selena Castillas. Selena has a really interesting perspective on a big topic in the service design community, and that is how to measure the effect and the impact of what we do. We'll talk about uh, a smarter and a probably better way to measure that impact of service design. So if that's the topic you're interested in, make sure to watch this episode till the very end. And if you like this episode and you would like to see more, don't forget that we bring new videos every week here on this channel. So if you don't want to miss anything, be sure to subscribe and click the bell icon so you'll be notified when new videos come out. And I've also got a free training on how to explain service design in plain English. If you're interested in that, check the show notes down below for the link to the training. So that's it for the introduction. And now let's quickly jump into the interview with Selena. Welcome to the show, Selena. Hola, Mark. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. Nice to have you on the show. Um, really excited because you were recommended, highly recommended, but uh, by one of the previous guests. Uh, so that's what I uh, always like. Selena, for the people who don't know who you are, could you give a really brief introduction? Who are you? Well, uh, I'm Selena Castilla. I'm a Mexican. I live in Mexico City. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree in arts, but life took another turn for me. And then I started working in web, web design back in the day when the dot-com era. And uh, it come now that I'm the design director for Scotiabank. And I'm in charge of uh, providing support to four countries here, which are Colombia, Peru, Chile, and Mexico. All right. Interesting, a bank, design, regional design director at a bank. Really curious which, which topics you picked. We'll be uh, there in a minute. Selena, this is called uh, the Service Design Show. And I always ask my guests, do you remember the very first time that you heard about the term service design? I'm not sure. To be pretty, to be pretty honest, I'm not sure when I first heard it. I mean, I come from... 10 years of working in design thinking. And at some point I started hearing a lot more of service design. I, I think that the first time I realized that the term, the term was coined, it was with the book. Uh, this is service Which book? This oh yeah, the classic, the, the black one. <laughs> yeah, the black one. So that's when I realized that there, were, there was something more other than design thinking, a more holistic view and a more practical approach. And I guess that that was the first time. I don't know if that was like, Eight years ago, maybe seven. Mm -hmm, I'm mm -hmm. not sure. I mean, I just arrived here in Mexico City, so I remember that okay. I saw it and was like, "Okay, this is something different." Cool, nice, Selena. I we're going to do interview jazz. I really, yeah. I, I'm going to register that domain really quickly. Uh, <laughs> do you? Are you ready to start? Yes. Me too. Okay. Um, I have your three topics here. Um, yeah, let's start with this one. Okay. The first topic is service design in Latin America. Do you okay. have a question starter? I think so. I have this one. Okay, it's why. why? And I would ask, why is service design important in Latin America? And uh, I mean, I can say a lot of things, but the first I can say is that the design practice needs to be elevated. Uh, here in, in Latin America and other countries, we still think of design as something uh, straight is strictly correlated to the aesthetics of something, right? Mm -hmm. Not into something that can solve problems or even provide solutions by taking opportunities of uh, growing for for people, right? So why design service in Latin America? Because this is the time. I guess that we are ready. 
we are prepared. Uh, we are willing to listen to these new terms and these new methodologies. We are willing to use them, and uh, we are willing to provide people with change. What What is the thing that you think will is needed to really take service design to the next level in Latin America? Well, um, number one is people understanding what it is and uh, mm -hmm. scaling their capabilities and skills from a tactical and operational design level into a more strategic one. Also, even if there's people that they are like, uh, they just like operating design, I think that there's a lot of opportunity and uh, intelligence in designers to start taking one step more and uh, taking a more holistic view on what it is. So that's one thing I would say. The other thing, uh, I'd say that it's a buy-in from companies and big institutions because there's a lot of small companies doing this, but the service design can only work with when you have someone that is willing to push it to the top, right? You need you so, need big clients, yeah. You need, I mean, more than big clients, big advocates, right? Mm. Because you can have a big client, they buy you in, but they don't understand what you're doing or something. Mm -hmm. They just mm. get the results. But when they really understand what you're doing and why you're doing it, it's not just buying into the results, it's buying into the whole methodology, right? In that philosophy. Mm. And, um... Do you feel that service design is in any way different in Latin America compared to what's happening in the States, what's happening in Europe? Are there... Well, it, here it's, it's still pretty new, right? And uh, it's still part of an ecosystem of buzzwords such as design thinking, uh, user-centered design, strategic design, even UX or even UI design, right? Mm. So, I don't, I don't think that we, we necessarily have the proper way to differentiate between one and another. So that's the main challenge for us who have been here for a long while, right? To, to mm. start providing people with distinctions between one thing and another and the value that each one provides into the services or, or into the things that you are designing, the solutions that you are designing. So who do you think uh, will be the leaders or the big who will be these big advocates? Where, where, where are they hidden right now? Um, my guess is that they are hidden in, in the top of the companies, but also in the bottom. Uh, for me, new methodologies depend on two, on two things. When you're talking a very hierarchical uh, constructions of, of companies, you have people who operate and you have people who make the huge decisions. And you have a lot mm. of people in the middle who are kind of tactical. And... Most of the times, people in the middle, they don't want things to be changed, right? Because mm -hmm, they are used mm -hmm, to yeah, things one way or another. Yeah. <laughs> but when you are talking about operations and, and mainly operational design and technology, for instance, also people is really junk and uh, very prone to, uh, to prove new stuff. So when you can connect this kind of drive with the drive of change that the people at the top need, but they don't understand how to make, that's when the change might happen. And I think that you can just start talking with people and figuring out who really understands what you're talking about or are willing to give it a try with mm -hmm. very simple stuff like, okay, let's build a customer journey map, right? Those are very simple tools, but once you put, in, put one in place, people start realizing that something, they are missing something, right? Mm -hmm. They don't mm -hmm. understand the whole, the whole view of design service or whatever, or service design, sorry but they can understand that something's missing and then you can help them fix them, fix it. Uh, but do you feel, is there, um, will this come from the public sector? Uh, will this come from the commercial sector? I think that it, it's easier for it to come to the com from the commercial sector mm -hmm. uh, because the governments here, at least in Mexico City, they are kind of very difficult organizations to navigate. So, it, it's difficult to enter them. Uh, there's also some uh, independent initiatives that are working with service design too. And I think that they are like doing a great job in advocacy, but they are the ones that are going to pull the other people from the companies. I think that it must come or it will come from people who are willing to pay for it more than the government. Yeah. I yeah. don't think the government yeah. is going to do it. Maybe I'm saying something terrible here, no, it's really, but... but I don't see the government paying for this anytime soon. Hmm. 
Um, so service design in Latin America, how would you just, so if we have to summarize uh, this, how would you describe the current state of service design? I would use one word, junk and driven. <laughs> That's mm. the second one, yeah. Mm. Junk, mm. but as, as everyone who is young is pretty driven and motivated. Young and driven, okay. Yeah. Are you ready to move on to topic number two? Okay. Yeah? Because yeah, sure. That's the, the, this, is, uh, this, is, uh, this is going to be a topic where we can uh, spend the next, <laughs> next 30 minutes on. Okay. Uh, it's called measuring service design. And okay. again, the question, do you have a question starter? Yeah, I, okay. So I just rolled the, the, the PDF, so I have this one. <laughs> Interesting. How far? So the, yeah. How far shall we go in measuring service design? Maybe that's a good question. That's a really good um, question. And uh, more than how to do it is how far shall, shall we go? And maybe I would say that we should measure it to the point where it makes sense for somebody else, right? Other than over measuring whatever we're doing in every step of the process, maybe we should figure out what can make us turn the wheel with the outcome and measure just the more precise things that are changing the service or making the service very important for people. I don't know if I okay. made anything. And now give us some examples. What do you mean? Maybe I'm going to start talking about the bank, right? Because yeah. those are my most fresh samples. It's like, go ahead. Yeah. We're designing the service in which we can provide people with a new um, car insurance, right? And a part of it is the digital platform, of course, because that's my day to day job. But that's not the only thing that you need to understand because their journey doesn't start there. And people, they are like, they have the, their concerns and their needs. And the journey starts much more uh, before that and ends. I mean, it, it should never end, right? Yeah. yeah. But which are the parts that we really want to measure about that? Are we willing to measure? If they really evaluated all, all, the, all the options, if they uh, are willing to, the how do you say it, recontract mm -hmm. automatically or not. And I would say that maybe that's important and that's important for the business and that's okay. I mean, we have to have a, a set of metrics. But also what, what I would like to really measure and understand is um, how do they feel with that service once they have it and once they use it? Uh, and sometimes we kind of not take a look at that, right? Uh, how do they feel with the small letters that come in in between all the contracts that they have to mm -hmm. sign? Mm -hmm. So maybe there's are there are some other things that if we measure them correctly, we are not just gonna change the business or sell more insurance, but we can really make a, a different service for those people. And I think that that that's our job. Right, mm -hmm. we give a set of metrics for the business, and that's okay. You can measure whatever your KPI is, but we also have to measure whatever is important for our, for the people, for the users. And you know, the, the, the saying "what gets measured gets done" is yes. one that I like uh, a lot. Um, yes. And me measuring uh, within service design is really a big topic because uh, everybody is saying that we need to measure, but it's hard to measure. Yeah. It's Yes. It's easy to it's easy to measure how many uh, new contracts you've signed, but how do you measure how do how do you measure the like you said how people feel about your service? How do you approach that? I mean, we definitely need to create a new set of metrics. That's and that's expensive, right? To understand which metrics do we wanna uh, do we wanna create and to follow up with them. Yeah, I yeah. think that it takes time. That's why I think that it's important to just pick just the priority or a couple of priorities and maintain your eyes on them. I would mm. say that one thing is obviously uh, keeping contact with people, right? Uh, but also, I mean, we need to start looking what's the better way to measure that because we need what? to start poking into the users constantly. So give us an insight into your head. How, what do you think we should be measuring? What are the things that really matter? Well, I mean, of course, it depends on the service, right? Uh, and uh, it, it depends. You can start with very basic stuff like security, certainty, um, which mm -hmm. are the very basic of the pyramid, right? 
yeah, to yeah. Do it that way. So if you're like providing a service that it's uh, very basic, I think that you should start, you should provide and measure the very basic stuff as you start going up and up into the pyramid. If you, if we think that's a good way to understand uh, human behavior, you need to start understanding where does the mind goes when I'm, for instance, if I am consuming a luxury watch, right? I don't care about the price. I don't mind about, about the features or functionalities. What is really important for me about a luxury luxury watch, right? Mm. Or is is it measuring time? Uh, is it really making it stand out in every time I use it? Uh, do I only like to have it, but I don't use it? So every time you go into into a, a new service or a solution, you need to understand where does the value from that solution come from? Because that's mm. the sweet spot which you should be looking at, right? Everyone that unstabilizes that is going to break up the solution. Mm. And now I'm, I'm trying to approach this from a different angle because the things we try to measure are really hard to quantify and are really therefore yeah. hard to um, sort of uh, put a business value price tag on that. Like mm -hmm. if, you, if you're in your example with uh, car insurance and you want to feel if people sort of feel safe and secure with, with, with their contract, do, have you found ways or methods to bring that back into a language that business people understand? Well, the, the, my first uh, approach to that is show them people saying stuff. Mm -hmm. That always put, makes people like, oh my God, so it, this is for real. Because when yeah. you have a business and you've been there for a, quite a while, you think that your business is the best thing in the world, that, that everyone is like willing to queue outside of your like store mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. to buy mm -hmm. whatever you're selling or consume whatever you're trying to provide them. But that's not the reality. Uh, and the, the best thing to start a conversation for me when I talk about this is like show them some proof that what the users say is different of what they think. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's different, right? If it's really different, which, which usually is. Because there are small nuances that even though they perceive that customers are not happy with the service, they cannot put the finger on the very, very, very uh, sweet spot. Mm. It's really interesting that you say that that uh, showing sort of what people are saying uh, is the measurement. This is exactly what I just said uh, this week in our project where, some, where our client asked, okay, we just did like 10 interviews with people. How, um, how are we going to sort of prove that, it, that, that this has value? And I just said, just show them the, the, the quotes. Yes. Just show them the photos. Yeah. You, you don't, that's, it's, it's not the... Uh, it's not the quantitative value that proves the, the, the impact on a measurement. It's a qualitative value. And just one yes. quote can have the same impact as a thousand numbers, right? Yes. That, that's like a, a muse bush, right? Once you show people that, they are willing to listen to everything else that you have to say. Yeah. <clears throat> What, uh, re in regards to measuring uh, service design, you said how far should we go? What is, um, what is too far in your opinion? I have we taken it too far? Are we trying to take it too far? Is that, is that the problem? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that here in LATAM, but since this is something that we are constantly worrying about, hmm. my take is more like, don't worry about taking it too far. Just focus on some few things that you really need to understand and you really need to follow up. Because for me, measuring uh, service design, it has to do a lot more with timing and, constant, and being constant, right? If you measure something month by month or quarter by mm -hmm. quarter, mm -hmm. that's more important than trying to measure like 12 things when you cannot follow up with any of those. Mm -hmm. That's a great insight. I really like that one. I just... And, and figuring out what the thing is that you need to measure, I guess that's the hard part, right? Yes. Yes, but I mean, in, if you do it right, you can have like a lot of things to understand in the long run, other than yeah. be trying to measure everything that's on your table and trying to provide yeah. that to the business because that's work and provide anything that's useful. And I guess that's why also th things like the uh, Net Promoter Score were so successful yeah. because they just focused on one question measuring one question and do it uh, like regularly and then that gives you sort of 
progress. It's, yes. it's like finding your net promoter score question. What is that? Yes. Yes, exactly. That's exa exactly it. Because the net promoter score, well, that's another story. <laughs> yeah, that's another story. But the power of that was really that they had just one, that they yes. have focus. It's just one question. Yes. Just measuring yep. one thing. Cool. Um, we're blazing through this, but the last one, uh, the third topic uh, is also super interesting, I think. And you, I think you can share a lot about this uh, from your role as a design director. So there we go. Uh, topic number three is building and leading. Building, leading and scaling. Okay, let me figure out. Okay, design jazz, drum roll. Hmm. What is it going to be, Selena? Oh, yes. Well, this is, this is a pretty good one. How can we, right? How, how can we build, lead, and scale design practices, right? Big topic, again, <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> but, but this is a good one, right? Because uh, the first thing that maybe you have to understand, or at, at least I, it took me a while to understand, it's like to not necessarily to build, but to lead and to scale you have to at some point start operating right so operating i mean like really uh managing the project yeah. by project of a team or people one person at a time you need to start like looking at a more holistic view of, of everything mm -hmm. you're building a uh, you need to build a design factory well uh, <laughs> more or less question yes. mark yeah, <laughs> I would say that some part of it can be a factory because mm -hmm. you need to start producing according to a methodology. And a, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. if you have the right people, they can like start producing that like as if they were tacos, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that there is uh, another layer, which is not necessarily the taco layer, like the factory <laughs> layer, which is you have to start putting dots together, right? Because you can have a, a lot of information produced, a lot of uh, ideas produced, but not not necessarily connected to the to the needs that you need to solve, right? In in a way that is strategic, and that's what you need different a different set of uh, mindsets, right? Or mm. skills, and how to how can I connect the dots? And if you're also talking about the biggest scale, you need people who can connect dots from let's say one city to another or one country to another, or one continent to another, which mm. that's when it gets complicated, right? Because yeah. we're talking about service design and services for people, and people is different everywhere. So um, what have you found in, what, what have been the biggest difficulties for you to lead and scale the design practice? Well, one, that it's pretty common here in Latin America, and uh, it's finding talent, because mm. every country it has a different state of maturity. So in one place, you can find like a lot of new service designers. Uh, here in Mexico, the oldest service designers are like, what, all eight years old? Or they yeah. come from another background yeah. or whatever. But there's yeah. a lot of people who has like, let's say five, three years doing stuff. So they are pretty new. And obviously mm -hmm. they didn't, most of them, they didn't uh, learn that at a school. Mm -hmm. There's a few people that, uh, I mean, they were uh, lucky to study somewhere else abroad, but most of them, they are just like making some courses here and there or uh, practices in, in some studios, no? Uh, so finding talent is one, mostly finding senior talent uh, or more experienced talent, it's, it's complicated. Uh, the other one, it's really, Understanding that you cannot follow a formula to build a design team, right? Why not? Why, why because, can't you follow a formula? Because it has a lot to do in the, in the context with the, where the team is going to live, right? So you can have some sort of template or idea and let's say, okay, so I need people who can, two service designers, maybe three people who do research, maybe do two or three people who do database or content mm -hmm. or UX or whatever else you want to name it. But then when you try to place a uh, team in a context, it, the needs of the context some of the time <clears throat> are a little bit different of what you expected. So you have to figure things out. I mean, for instance, here in Mexico, in the team that we built for the bank, we started this research group. And in this research group, now there's only one researcher. There's one service designer. 
But there's one girl that is just specialized in providing or creating learning experiences, right? Mm. Mm. Not necessarily e-learning in the formal term that we knew like 20 yeah. years ago, but learning materials, because that's what was needed to connect what everything, everything we are doing to all of the areas of the business and also with the people to make the service available, right? Yeah. Really available, yeah. not yeah. just to throw it out there, just to make it really available and consumable. So that happens every time you go to another place and you figure out, okay, so you have this org chart that uh, HR provided you and they downloaded <laughs> from somewhere in Google yeah. or whatever, or a friend of a friend gave it to yeah. them. Yeah. But in reality, you need to find the right people, right? The skills and the people. For me, that's, that's about building it. Mm. And, and um, okay, skills and people. And how do you, um, what kind of, uh, processes and structures have you put into place or are you trying to put in place to make this scalable so that so that it's easier to it's about I, I think I talked with Bernardo about this topic that what we're <laughs> trying to scale is scale output right scale impact it's not so much about scaling the same team but it's about scaling impact what, what are your thoughts yeah. about processes structures I mean, to scale something, the first thing is not having a lot of people. It's connecting people. At mm. least that's how, how it has been for me the, these last few months that I'm just taking this charge. And it's, what are your superpowers, right? Let's figure out if we can join the, those superpowers in building uh, common platforms, learning or knowledge mm. platforms. Because also, I mean, we have a lot of uh, book by the book processes, right? Building some some stuff, making interviews, uh, drawing some reports or providing mm, data mm -hmm. or finding solutions even. But we need to find the common ground of what works for us, right? Not what's on a book, but what works for us as a community and also start uh, building some uh, frameworks that belong only to us and to that context. Yeah. yeah. And for me, that's been amazing because uh, let's say that we are talking about people who are, let, let's say, service designers. Here in the teams of design, there are just one or two per country. And one or two per country, they are fine, but they feel alone, right? Yeah, in the end, yeah. they cannot have very deep conversations with people who are doing UI or interviews with users or whatever. So when mm. you can connect all of those people, they are willing to talk about it and to build new stuff. and mm. also. To start from the point of another one and take it far in a way. So that for me, it's amazing to see when you provide someone with something and they take it and then they, boom, they, they grow it. And then the next mm. one, they grow it even more. I, I really like that, that it's about uh, scaling design. It's about building a community for yeah. and, and making design, uh, finding your own version of design or finding your own Right? That's yes. I mean, providing your own perspective into design. Yeah, exactly. Right? And I, I think what I've seen and I've uh, been advocating that on the show also is that uh, that's that's what you said about the textbook designers. I think we're sort of um, service designers. We're quite humble. Usually, we sort of try to be facilitate the, the, the facilitator. And I think it would be really good if more service designers stepped forward and brought their own perspective into their into design uh, to bring it to make it their own flavor but i think we're it's good that we're humble but sometimes we need to be more leaders yes and, and i mean as i was saying here in latin america we're young and driven young so and driven. we're young yeah. we're learning but we we're also driven i mean we if, if we feel like we have the freedom uh to change or to tune mm. it we will do it mm. cool um selena you haven't prepared this question, so we're going to see how it goes. But I'm okay. really curious. You have a lot of things on your mind, and I'm sure there are things that keep you awake at night related to service design. Is there a question or a topic, well, a question that you would like to ask us, the people who are watching the show, who are listening to the podcast? Well, I mean, how can we be more connected? For me, that's the main question because we can find a lot of people everywhere, but how can we be more really, really connected? If I need something, how can I just reach someone who is in another country and have an answer like 
not necessarily quick, but soon. Okay, interesting. How can we be more connected as a service design, as a global service design community? Yes. Hmm. Yes, I would like that. I would like that too, and I'm I'm really interested. Uh, just one question about it: Do you feel that the current platforms, which are primarily online, what are they lacking for you to to fill that gap? Um, immediacy, I guess. I mean, for mm. instance, here in Latin America, we are very prone to use this uh, this application that it's called WhatsApp. I don't know if you mm -hmm. know it. We have it here too. <laughs> if, if, if we can do something like a WhatsApp, like so easy to reach or Slack or something, something that is not like uh, in this envelope of uh, formality, something mm -hmm. that it's pretty much more casual. Like let's say we maybe we can do it. We can bring a, a live and Slack group with people and just to start throwing people there mm. and making channels for something. Let, let's say there's a Slack channel for Latin America service design or the Slack, uh, the Slack group of the service designers with more than 20 years of experience or something like mm. that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I'm really interested to what people have to say about this. I have my own thoughts, so I, I'll, mm. uh, I'll add a comment to the video as well. Celino, we are sort of reaching the end of this episode already. Time, uh, time flies by. Yeah, it was quick. <laughs> it was. Uh, it's just thirty mm -hmm. minutes, so it flies by. I really want to thank you for sharing your thoughts and what's on your mind and your perspective on service design in Latin America. It's really good to hear that on the show because, like I said uh, in our chat before, I think service design should be is much more. Uh, globally than we sometimes see. So I'm really happy that you shared your perspective. I'm really glad that you invited me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. So what's your tip to be more connected with a global service design community? Share your thoughts and ideas down below in the comments and let's continue the conversation there. I'll try to reply to every comment that is posted. If you enjoyed this episode with Selena, don't forget to click that like button and share this episode with someone who might enjoy our talk too. If you're interested in learning how to explain service design, don't forget that you can sign up for my free training and the link is down below in the show notes and over here. Thanks again for watching and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.